Please take your copy of the scriptures and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, please follow along with me as I read the entire chapter before Dr. Barrett comes and speaks to us. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same. And your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? And we'll end the reading of God's holy word there. And please join me in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our great triune God, we do come before you this afternoon with humility as we've just heard about your incomprehensibility, your infinitude. And Lord, we're reminded uh, ever so clearly of our finiteness, of our need, our dependence upon you for all things, even uh, a most basic apprehension of who you are, O God. Lord God, we do pray that you would condescend to us here, even this week, as we seek to know you better, that we might worship you more. Lord, help us in these ways. We do pray that you'll be with our next speaker, Dr. Barrett, and that you'll give him clarity of mind and speech as he opens your truths to us and give us attentiveness, even this uh, late afternoon hour. We pray, Lord, that you will be with us now, one and all, as we come to your word and your truth. May we, may it cause us to adore you, Lord. May it inflame our hearts to love you more. We pray this for the sake of your Son, Jesus, our Savior and our God. Amen. Our next speaker, as you know, is Dr. Matthew Barrett. Ma Dr. Barrett is Associate Professor of Christian Theology at Midwestern Theological Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri. He is also a pastor of Emmaus Church. Dr. Barrett is the author of numerous books, including Simply Trinity, The Unmanipulated Father, Son, and Spirit. He is the founder of Credo Magazine and the host of the Credo Podcast, if you haven't heard that yet, be sure to add that, subscribe to that one. Uh, great interviews, great conversations on Credo Podcast. He's currently writing a systematic theology. And he is also the director of the Center for Classical Theology. Dr. Barrett, please come now and open God's word to us.
Well, it's wonderful to be with you this afternoon, uh, though I do have something to say right out of the gate. Who in the world put me right after James? <laughs> and right before dinner. <laughs> this seems like a setup, possibly a conspiracy, though. All I have to say is this, though. At least I get to go before Richard Barcelos. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it really is wonderful to be here. Um, when I received the invitation for this conference and, and saw the others who were speaking, I thought, well, I, I would just like to attend and uh, soak it in. And after that message by James, uh, I, I was right. Uh, what, what a wonderful opportunity for all of us to uh, just sit, sit at the feet of our great God. This afternoon, uh, on the heels, though we didn't plan this, on the heels of the last message you heard about God's incomprehensibility. Well, I want to talk to you about a doctrine that is, believe it or not, yes, incomprehensible. And that is not just the Trinity, but something specific, a doctrine we call the eternal generation of the Son. Have your finger in Hebrews chapter 1, because I will be referring uh, to that chapter, especially the opening verses, though we will also jump around to a couple of other passages as well. Well, my family and I live in Kansas City. And when I checked in to my hotel, uh, the lady there said, Kansas City, really? I said, yes, it's a great, wonderful place. We have lots of barbecue. I don't know how the barbecue is here, but we take a lot of pride in our barbecue in Kansas City. And so my family uh, has really enjoyed uh, our time there so far. But we haven't always lived in Kansas City. Uh, we actually lived overseas in London uh, before we moved to Kansas City. Well, if you've just been a tourist in London, uh, you haven't really experienced the real thing, the year-long London, as I call it. London can be a very dark, dark place. And I mean that in the plainest sense. The sun and all the happiness it brings, which you know a lot about here, <laughs> it's blocked by those imposing gray clouds. Tourists in July just don't realize that most of the year the city is covered in what I call a blanket of gloom, expunging incandescent, incandescence wherever it's found, hunting it down. But one year, when we were living over there, I was actually asked, invited, to come speak at a conference in Houston, Texas. And you, living here, will no doubt resonate with what I'm about to say. I'll never forget it. After a 14-hour flight over the Atlantic, the plane finally landed. And I walked out of the airport, and I was met by this giddy smile of a prosperous blue sky. It's glistening sunshine just coating my vitamin D deficient face. <laughs> you think I'm white now and I look like a ghost. You have no idea. I felt, sorry to be over dramatic here, I felt as if I had been altogether redeemed brought back to planet Earth after a long, dreary, dispirited exile. <laughs> and with a smile spreading across my face from ear to ear, I would have bent down and kissed the grass under my feet if it weren't for that police officer standing next to me. He had not looked like I was some type of alien from another planet. But on that happy day... I looked up and I thanked the sun for its radiance, taking it for granted for so long, never again. Did you know that light is actually one of the most important concepts in the Bible? In fact, the Bible uses it everywhere. For what? Well, for all kinds of things, but to describe God even. 
the author of Hebrews, could have chosen any number of concepts to describe the Son of God himself. But he chose to open this book, this letter, with this word, radiance. Except Hebrews uses this idea of light in a way that differs from other books of the Bible. You don't have to turn there, but think about the book of James, for example. James also uses light to talk about God. Every good gift, every perfect gift, this is James chapter 1, by the way, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Notice here, James uses the imagery of light to differentiate between the unchanging, immutable creator on the one hand and the very changing, mutable creation on the other hand. The father of lights, that's a phrase which describes him as a creator of the great lights of the sky. Isn't it interesting how the New Testament authors always seem to make their way back to the book of Genesis? Here, describing this great creator of the lights of the sky in order to bring to our minds his unchanging nature. One who is without variation. One who is without a shadow that's due to change. And therefore, James can rejoice and say to the church, He is the giver of every single good gift that you have. Every one. Why? Because in the midst of our very changing world that we live in, these gifts come from a God who does not change. For all the biblical authors, there is a clear difference indisputable distinction between the immutable creator and his mutable creation, a distinction that we dare not violate. But here's a question for you, coming back to Hebrews chapter 1. Does the author of Hebrews locate the Son of God with the Father of lights or with his changing creation? In Hebrews, the Son shares the same glory as God. Because he is, Hebrews says, the very radiance of God's glory, to use his language. The exact imprint of God's nature, he says. Unless we think otherwise, notice how the author of Hebrews then identifies the Son with the creator himself, rather than the creation. In fact, he goes so far to even name the Son as the one through whom God created the world. Look at verse 2. The sustainer of the cosmos. Verse 3, the one upholding the the world by the word of his power. The author of Hebrews will do the same if you Look down at Hebrews 1.10 by appealing to Psalm 102, a passage that speaks of God as our creator and concludes that what the psalmist says should also be said of the Son himself. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. The Son, then, is not to be identified with the creation, but with the Creator. Notice here, the Father is not the Son's Creator, like the creation we saw in James 1.17. Rather, the Father is the Son's, and this word is important, eternal, eternal source, His everlasting principle, which is why Hebrews 1.3 describes the Son how? 
as the radiance of the glory of God itself. As one theologian has said, as light naturally radiates its brightness, so too God naturally radiates His Son. Lights and its splendor are one. One of my favorite church fathers, Gregory of Nyssa, said it this way. He talked about the sun, and he said, the sun is the resplendent effulgence of the glory of God. The sun is the resplendent, ever-lucent, beaming effulgence of God and his everlasting immensity. A theologian by the name of John Webster said it this way, the sun is the self diffusive presence of the one who is himself unapproachable splendor. God's glory is God himself in the perfect majesty and beauty of his being. The glory is resplendent. Why? Because God himself is light, he pours forth light. And maybe we could add there forever. This is why the Nicene Creed, one of the most important creeds in the history of the Christian church, the Nicene Creed describes the Son's generation from the Father, an idea we will return to in a minute, but it describes it how? As light from light. Nicaea is not speculating in some strange way, but it's actually echoing the biblical witness to describe the Son's eternal, everlasting relation of origin, what we call His filiation. The Son is light because He is the eternal offspring of light. Here is our doctrine of eternal generation once again. But this time, notice, it's wrapped up in this Mysterious imagery of light itself. Look at Hebrews 1, verse 3. The author switches from light to this language of imprint. Says that the Son is the exact imprint of God's nature. He's once again confirming the co equality of the Son with the Father. And yet, as an imprint, he is not the same person as the Father. He's the Son. Yes, he's of the same nature, but Hebrews distinguishes him as the Son who is from the Father, much like an imprint from its originating template or source. The concept of imprint does not, and notice here, notice, listen, we have to be really careful we don't impose our very finite and sometimes very flawed understanding of things onto God. Notice here, this concept of imprint does not undermine or distract from what we just learned about radiance. In fact, it complements it in every way. For if he is the exact imprint, or as Paul says in Philippians 2.6, in the form of God, then he is begotten, as the church fathers love to say, he's begotten from the Father's divine nature. Nothing less, nothing less than true God, representing the divine essence itself. You see, radiance of the glory of God, imprint of God's nature. Do you see what the author of Hebrews is trying to tell you? Both of these accentuate the Son's eternal origin from the Father, which raises a very difficult question. How then is the Son begotten from the Father? How is He generated from the Father? Well, we don't have time, but if we did have time, I suppose we could go to John's Gospel, couldn't we? And we, we could explore how John speaks of this same, same idea with this language of begotten, begetting. And we, of course, we just saw this with the book of Hebrews, but with the imagery of light. But if we were to pursue this further, we could survey the scriptures 
and you would see a very vibrant, colorful mosaic in front of you. In fact, once you see this, it's almost as if you see it everywhere. John 1 opens his gospel, and he not only uses that language of begetting, but he also says this son is the word from God, the word of God, the word who is God. Jesus in John 5, just a few chapters later, describes the Father and then just starts to describe himself. And what do we learn there? We learn that the Son, well, the Son is life. But in Jesus' own words, he's life from life. Colossians 1, Paul names the Son as the very image of the invisible God. And in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul identifies the Son as the wisdom of God. A play that capitalizes on the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 8. In fact, even the Synoptic Gospels, none of this is lost on them either. In Matthew chapter 2, we hear echoes, don't we, of the prophet Micah, Micah 5 to be exact, calling Jesus... Jesus, the ancient of days. This doctrine of eternal generation, notice though, it's far more organic, embedded than you could ever imagine. It's manifested in the very revelation of the gospel itself. The Son is sent by the Father. And we witness this incarnation in history because this is the Son. How fitting is this? This is the Son, the same Son who's begotten from the Father from all eternity. Eternal generation is not found in some random mere proof text or verse that you just happen to dig up. It's the very warp and woof of Scripture's entire storyline. It's everywhere. It explains everything you should at least believe about who Jesus is. But what does this mean exactly for the Son to be begotten, to be generated from the Father? Well, Remember what we learned just an hour ago. Our God is absolutely incomprehensible. So we have to tread carefully, don't we? But if we were to humbly try to describe the mystery of this doctrine, perhaps we could start this way and say, from all eternity... The Father communicates the one, simple, undivided, divine essence to the Son. Now, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but in the last century, we have done a terrible job of preserving, confessing, and understanding this great, grand truth. All too often, we have either neglected it altogether, we just don't understand it, get rid of it, or we've just rejected it outright, or we've tried to read something human into it, to limit it, to even project something of our own human experience into it. And when approaching this mystery, We put too much of ourselves into it. How then do we approach this mystery? With humility. We must rid our minds, first of all, of anything carnal, anything impure that could taint it. Now, what might that include? Well, let's call these the nine marks 
of human generation that should not characterize divine generation. Nine marks of what we could call an unhealthy generation. These aren't original to me by any means. In fact, if you read some of the church fathers, the Cappadocians, for example, individuals like Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzus, and others, or if you were to skip way ahead to one of my favorite Baptist theologians, John Gill, you might discover this line of thought as well. All of them are very careful at this point to say what eternal generation is not. And notice in theology, right, we are oftentimes on much safer ground by saying what God is not rather than being so arrogant as if we can describe what he is. And this is what they did. So what are these nine marks of an unhealthy generation? Number one, and perhaps we could put it this way, the son's eternal generation from the father, number one, it cannot involve a division of the divine nature. The Father doesn't somehow break off a piece of divinity and hand it to his Son, while somehow, I suppose, keeping some of it for himself. Number two, eternal generation cannot involve a multiplication of the divine essence. The Father doesn't multiply the essence so that the Son has another essence or his own essence or an additional essence. Number three, Eternal generation involves no priority and no posteriority. In other words, the Father is not superior to the Son, nor is the Son before or after the Father. And then I'm going to throw a whole bunch of them together here. Number four, five, and six. Eternal generation, it involves no motion, no mutation or change and certainly no alteration. In other words, no change somehow occurs in God. The Father and the Son don't morph into something else if they weren't before. There is no before. There is no after. Number seven, it cannot involve any type of corruption, which follows from the previous points, doesn't it? Divinity in all of its perfection is not compromised by eternal generation. Number eight, there's no lessening as a result of this. There's no reduction either in the Father or in the Son. And finally, we never see a ceasing from operation. Remember, this generation is an eternal generation generation. Now, I suppose if we want to skip dinner, we could spend time expositing each and every one of these. I'm getting some looks in the back that say, please don't. But, but, I think we have enough time to explore maybe one or two that are especially dangerous, that you would do well to be aware of. The sons, let's take this one, the sons' generation, it involves no priority, no posteriority, and we could add it certainly then involves no inferiority. Rather, it designates origin in the Trinity alone. Now, previously, I said, I emphasize that the Son is begotten by the Father, But notice, unlike our human experience of a father begetting a son, this son's begetting is eternal. Or in the language of the creeds, it is before all ages. We could use the word timeless. And if it's eternal, then the generation of the son is not the generation, notice, of a lesser being, 
made in time or before time or somehow circumscribed or limited by time. Rather, the generation of the Son is a, is a Son who is equal in deity to the Father in every way. But the reason the Son is not inferior to the Father is because the one undivided, simple, indivisible divine essence, it wholly subsists, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly subsists in the Son due to his generation from the Father's divine nature. This is why the Nicene Creed uses that famous phrase, true God from true God. There can be no reduction of the begetter's essence in the generation of the Son. The Father begets His Son, and the two are to return to that, a very key, crucial word that was used by our fathers. They are consubstantial. Consubstantial. Meaning they are to be identified by the same, self-same divine essence. There's no priority. There's no posteriority. All of this would undermine the Son as consubstantial, as one who is of the same essence as the Father. Consider the biblical imagery of light once more. Imagery that we see in the opening of John's gospel, John chapter 1, verse 4, and verses 8 through 9. I mentioned a minute ago how the Nicene Creed says that the Son's eternal generation from the Father can be described as light from light. Did you know that the church father Gregory of Nazianzus also appealed to this imagery of light? But he did so for a very specific reason. He did so to counter a very popular, rampant belief at the time, a belief that said that the Son must be subordinate to the Father. These subordinationists, as we could call them, said, in effect, is inferior to its cause, and therefore the Son must be less subordinate than the Father. Consider the Son, they said. It is the cause of light, but by no means, Father said in response, is light inferior to its source. In essence, they are one and the same. How much more so with divinity? Is not the divine essence simple, without parts, undivided, inseparable, eternal, infinite, and immutable, they asked? For this reason, they were willing to say, well, the Father, the Father is the principle in the Godhead, the principle who alone is without principle. They described him as unbegotten. But that does not mean, they were very quick to clarify, that does not mean that the Father and Son are anything but co-equals. To read some type of hierarchy into these origins is to abuse them. It's to humanize them, even manipulate them. The Father may be the principle without principle, but he is also the principle without priority, they said. Listen to these profound words by Gregory. They do not have, referring to God here, the Trinity, they do not have degrees of being God or degrees of priority over against one another. They are not, listen to this, notice how careful he is here to remove any, any wiggle room to somehow insert hierarchy here. They are not sundered in will they are not divided in power. You cannot find there any of the properties, any of the properties at all inherent in things, in things that are divisible, he says. Do you see what lengths he's going to here to make sure that the Godhead, as he says, it exists undivided? Hierarchy, priority, these are precluded by the very nature, will, 
power, and yes, even glory that Father, Son, and Spirit hold in common. Unfortunately, I wish I could say none of this was relevant to our day in the 21st century. Unfortunately, some today have compromised the Son's unity with the Father in nature or will or power or perhaps even glory. They've tried to have their cake and eat it too, believing they can affirm the Son's equality with the Father but still subordinate the the Son to the Father in some way. And they don't merely have in mind here, say, the incarnation, but rather eternity, or as we would say, the Trinity in and of itself, apart from the world, believing as they do that the Son is defined as a person by His subordination to the Father. Equal in essence, subordinate in role, they say. The Father in this view becomes a greater glory, a greater authority, a greater supremacy than the Son. In light of what we've learned so far, What do we make of this? How do we think about this? How should we respond? First, we must be careful that we don't assume the persons of the Trinity are just like persons in human society. When we slip into that language, at least the way it's being used here, language like roles and relationships, we run the risk of elevating one person over another as if each person is somehow independent, their own individual with their own will, their own center of consciousness, and so on. As if something like power or glory or authority can be exclusive to one person like the Father, but kept from the other persons of the Trinity. What am I saying? I am advising you, I'm advising us, let's not turn the biblical and orthodox Trinity into a social paradigm of individual agents and individuals that each require their own volitional faculties to do so is to flirt with tritheism. Let's not forget that the persons are distinguished by one thing alone, what we could call their eternal relations of origin. If we try to insert something else, anything else, something that looks a a lot more like our society, something like roles of hierarchy, notice how quickly We compromise the one undivided and simple essence, will, power, and glory that Father, Son, and Spirit have in common. Second, it might sound neat and tidy to say that the Son can be, say, equal in essence to the Father, but nonetheless functionally subordinate in role. But that distinction does not work. Remember, each person, to introduce maybe some language that could be new but very helpful to us, each person is a subsistence, the one undivided same divine essence. Yes, we do distinguish, as we should, between, say, the persons. We use language like this to help us, right? Person and essence. But notice the divine essence is not some fourth thing out there. Rather, to be son is to be begotten, to be generated from the Father's divine essence. Or to use our theological language, the one divine essence has three modes of subsistence. And one of them we've described already, the son's eternal generation, the son's filiation. What does this mean then? It means that you cannot insert 
some type of subordination into the person of the Son without littering the divine essence with that same inferiority as well. Third, and this one's for all you Bible readers out there, which I hope there are many. We must play by Scripture's rules, its categories, rather than our own. We must carefully distinguish between God as God in and of himself and God towards, in relation to the world. Never conflating the two. We risk conflation whenever we look at, say, the incarnation, and we start projecting anything and everything that occurs back into the Trinity. If we see, for example, the Son submit to the mission the Father gave him, we have to be careful we don't assume, well, he must just be subordinate even apart from the world, even before the world, as Son. That would be a colossal mistake. What then is a better interpretation? Well, a better interpretation pays attention to the diverse and very beautiful ways that Scripture describes, speaks about Jesus. Have you ever noticed these? Sometimes Scripture refers to Jesus in the form of God. In John chapter 10, for example, when Jesus himself says, he is one with the Father. And what's the reaction? They want to kill him. Other times, Scripture refers to Jesus in the form of a servant. Like when it refers to how he humbled himself to the very point of death. Hebrews speaks this way, and so does Paul and Philippians. Still other times, it refers to the Son being sent from the Father. Augustine loved to point this one out as well, saying there's also this, lang this sending language, which just seems to be littered throughout the Gospel of John. Augustine was quite pointed, though, especially against those who subordinated the Son in his day. He said, if we confuse these, if we start mixing these and interchanging them with one another, form of God with form of the servant, Augustine said, we risk humanizing God himself, projecting what occurs by virtue of Christ, assuming human nature into the whole trinity. And friends, this has been the story of the modern period that you have inherited. Which brings us to a fourth point. We must not miss the very point of the incarnation. If Jesus' submission to the Father, as sometimes it's called in the incarnation, is something that he does anyway, something that just defines him as son in the imminent life of the Trinity apart from the world, a mere continuation of eternity, then the scandal of the incarnation, which Scripture so often highlights, and its amazing grace is lost. Philippians 2.8 says, The Son being found in human form humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Don't miss this. Obedience was not something the Son did say, prior to the incarnation in the form of God as the eternal Son of God. No, the Son humbled himself. This is the, script, this is the language that Scripture uses. Humbled himself first in his incarnation, even to suffer on a cross. This, then, is the proper context for the obedience that Paul describes. You see, this incarnate, this humiliating obedience, it is scandalous. Precisely because it's not something the Son of God does in glory within the imminent life of the Godhead apart from the world. 
Hebrews 5.8 says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He did not obey for his sake, but for ours, which is why grace is so amazing to begin with. What then are the implications of this grand doctrine, as mysterious as it is? What are the implications for you as a Christian? Let me mention two, though there are many more. Number one, let's think about your new birth, your regeneration. Do you understand Do you realize that unless the Son of God, unless He is born from the Father from all eternity, you have little confidence that you can be born again and enter the kingdom of this same Son? Do you remember Jesus' words in John chapter 5? For as the Father has life in Himself, so has he granted the Son also to have life in himself. If this is not true, then the Son cannot give life to you who so desperately need it. That should empower your evangelism. Shouldn't it? Shouldn't it galvanize your conversations with your co-worker who does not know Christ? We do not hold out to the world a Savior who hopes and wishes he can somehow, in some way, turn this world around. No, we hold out to a world lost in the death of darkness, a Savior who can raise the dead to new life. This is why Augustine, listen to these words, Augustine boldly summoned unbelievers everywhere. He said to them, look to none other than the only begotten Son, What about you, soul? You were dead. Is that you? You were dead. You had lost life. Listen to the Father through the Son. Arise, receive life, in order that the life which you do not have in yourself you may receive in the one who does have life in himself. If Augustine's words sound strange to you, perhaps a more familiar tune will sound familiar. Maybe you've sung it before, perhaps around Christmas time. Hark the herald angels sing. The third stanza of Wesley's timeless hymn says this. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Friends, apart from the sons, apart from this doctrine, it's apart from the only begotten son, begotten from the Father from all eternity, can you actually have any confidence, any confidence at all, any assurance that you can, that you have, that the lost will be reborn? The sons of earth only receive their second birth if this prince of peace is heaven born. Second and last, what about your 
adoption. Have you ever reflected on what it means to be a child of God? If Jesus is not the eternal, only begotten Son of the Father, you have no hope. You have no hope, nor do you have any right to be so bold, to be so courageous, to be so daring, to call God your Father. No right whatsoever. How dare you? Unless, unless, the Son himself is the Son of the Father by nature. Because if he's the Son of the Father by nature, we can boldly approach the throne of the Father by grace. The Father, through his Son, has accomplished our redemption. And we, we sinners, as a result, are the recipients of his Son's grace a thousand times over. Is this not what Paul assumes when he writes to the Galatians? Galatians chapter 4, concerning their adoption. How does he introduce, how does he celebrate? How should we celebrate our adoption? In the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, Sound like Hebrews 1? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, We, as his adopted sons, have life in his eternal son. And through him, the Spirit communicates to us all of the Father's benevolence. As those who receive this everlasting grace, as those who benefit from this unceasing mercy, how then, how else can we respond but to cry out and say, Abba, Father. With every confidence, he will receive us as sons in his son, as Paul says in Romans 8. Have you ever noticed how Paul finishes Galatians chapter 4, at least that section of it? So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, you, Christian, are an heir through God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is only because Jesus is the eternally begotten son that he is able, that he is qualified to descend into the deep depths of this God-forsaken world, be born as a babe in a manger, and ascend back to his father with a host, a host of newborn sons in his wake. Unless he is born from the father from all eternity, he cannot be sent by the father to be born as a man in salvation history, nor ensure that you, who have trusted in him, as the only begotten Son of God, will be adopted as sons yourself. Apart from his eternal sonship, you have no hope that you are adopted as sons and receive all the benefits of your union with the Son himself, Christ Jesus. Let's pray.
Lord, so often we think of theology in a way that's so detached from who you are and what you have done to save us. Lord, this type of thinking has led us in the past to dispense with all kinds of critical beliefs about who you are, including eternal generation. Lord, how we have lost out. Not only because we have incorrectly gazed at the Son, but also because we then do not understand the magnitude of the benefits that we have in this Son. Lord, open our eyes so that we can just a little know this Son. Because apart from you, Lord Jesus, we have no life. It's in the name of Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.